Growth and profit are a product of how people work together. As you can see, that's according to Ricardo Semler of Semco. Good morning, as you heard, my name's Karen Bird and I work with William Buck Christmas Gowland. And it's fair to say we are absolutely delighted to be here today and for the first time to be the naming rights sponsor for the CFO Symposium in Auckland. And uh, we thought that we would do something a little bit different this morning and talk you through this topic of how to make uh, profit through people. So I'm going to start by running very quickly through the agenda and uh, we hope we have your attention for 45 minutes. We're going to keep it moving quickly, a little bit of interaction for you, so hopefully it'll be a lively session. First up, I'm going to briefly tell you about four success stories from around the world, organisations that have done particularly well by focusing on people. Secondly, we're going to look at the technology that you have in front of you, the little voting pads, where we're going to give you the chance to vote on some very recent research from our friends at CEB. Then I introduce Kim Daji, who's our main speaker. She's the HR director from William Buck Christmas Gowland. And Kim will talk about this, uh, this idea of profits through people. Tell a case study, which is actually of our firm. And uh, she's going to be briefly interviewing a couple of members of our firm and will have some takeaways for you. They're not fatty takeaways, useful takeaways. Uh, but we're also going to find time in the 45 minutes to squeeze in some bad accountant jokes. So how does that sound? Okay. Just before I tell you about these four success stories, I just want to point out the four industries they are from. And as you can see, those industries are not the softest, most cuddly industries in the world which makes the story of uh, concentrating on people to make profit even more compelling. So back to the first example, Semco. Brazilian-based company in 1982, the dad handed the business over to the son that was doing okay at the time. As you can see, it was making four, uh, turning over $4 million. But it's fair to say that the son made some considerable changes to the business. In fact, he turned it into a radical form of industrial democracy, the like of which is still extremely unusual even today. Just one example of that is since the 80s, the managers have set their own salaries. Sounds a little risky, doesn't it? So this demo democratic company that allows managers to set their own salaries, how's it done since 82? Well, not bad. They're just about very close to a quarter of a billion US in turnover. And you might actually recognise that picture there. It is our state highway number one. They're now big enough that they have operations in New Zealand. Next example, Southwest Airlines, a very well-known discount organisation. And of course, with discount organisations, it's quite tricky to get your people to really feel strongly about you. You don't often hear about Walmart employees en masse professing the love for their company. But... Southwest, as well as having that absolutely necessary uh, obsession on cutting costs, had an equal obsession on relationships. So building relationships between management and staff and between staff themselves. Now notice the language used by Herb Kelleher, the founder. A company is stronger if it's bound by love. That sounds rather unbusinesslike, doesn't it? Bound by love, and how have they been doing? Bearing in mind, as we know, that airlines are very, very difficult, excuse me, to turn a consistent profit in. How have they done? 40 consecutive years of profitability. Unheard of in this industry. Last year, they turned over 19 billion. Are they profitable? I'd say 1.1 billion US is a profit. Our third example, Plant Moran. This is a chartered accounting firm in the United States, Michigan-based. It's the 11th largest cha uh, chartered accounting firm. It's a member of Praxity, which is the world's largest uh, chain of, or I should say, group of accounting firms, and a sister organization of ours, William Buck Christmas Gowland, also a member of that group. They have been known in the United States as one of the best employers for a number of years now, as you can see. It's not often professional services are right up the top there. Note the language used by one of their staff members. Chartered accounting firm, and it's not about the money, it's about the people. And I love that terminology, relatively jerk-free. Well, it's one measure. So what about the numbers? 260 partners, and last year they turned over 404 million. Again, pretty impressive. Final example is from New Zealand. 
While Mars New Zealand is, of course, part of an international corporate, in New Zealand it's a very family-style company, very egalitarian, a high emphasis on empowerment. And just one example of how unusual they are is dog days, where, yes, they encourage their staff to bring the pet dog to work. They have five values, three of which sound a lot like most organisations, and then there's mutuality and freedom. Freedom as a value. Again, it sounds very soft, doesn't it? Very unbusinesslike. Notice again the language used by the GM in New Zealand, a never-ending journey to equip their associates, to make them better at their job and happier at their job. Last year, they won the Mid to Large Conexa Best Workplace Survey in New Zealand. But again, what about the numbers? And this is a company that initially made losses for several years in New Zealand. Well, last year, 195 million turnover, and I'd call 20 million a profit. So that's our four examples. Moving quickly on to the technology in front of you. You will note that of these tiny little voting pads, there's about one between three of you. So I'm now going to put up three research questions, very, very recent research. Please just press one through five. There will be one through five answers. Our first example is coming up next. Thank you. Now, I know this looks like a joke. It is genuine research. It's just a practice one before we look at some finance team uh, research. So I'm going to ask you, I'll give you 30 seconds, not much time to discuss it with the people next to you, and then vote, just press button, one through five, to give the answer. Does that make sense? Any questions? You're already having fun. So 30 seconds starting now, and when you finish, look back up at the board, because one of the bad jokes will be up there. We can add the answer uh, or the uh, the answers up, please. So, fifty. What a cynical bunch you are. Fifty-one percent. Of course, you're absolutely right. <laughs> cynical or just educated? I'm trying to press us forward. What's going on here? Oops, I pressed twice. So I've just spoiled my punchline. I was going to say you're absolutely right. The answer is 51% and maybe that explains this. <laughs> or maybe not, that's not what we're here to talk about. So now we're talking about finance teams in particular. This is, is international research from this year, from our friends at CEB. And the question, as you can see, is those finance teams that concentrate not just on technical skills, but also on non-technical, on soft skills within their teams, how much more likely are they to be able to attract and to retain the best talent? 30 seconds starting now, please. Some of you are waiting for the joke, so I better put it up there. <laughs> Two jokes in one. It's not bad value. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, and the answer is finance teams who invest in soft skills as well as in technical skills are three times as likely to be able to attract and retain the best talent. Very significant figure, I'm sure you'll agree. Next question, another serious one from CEB. Looking at those same teams, bearing in mind they also invest in soft skills, how much more likely are they to be highly productive versus other finance teams? 30 seconds starting now, please. You can tell your CFO is very quick decision makers. Good at analyzing, quick decision makers. I might as well put the joke up there.
OK, we'll move on to the answer. The joke's not, not very popular. We, I did say they were bad. And the answer, or oh, sorry, the, uh, yes, the voting is, so you thought that three and a half times as likely, you're just going for the big numbers here, aren't you? I guess that's an instinct for a CFO. Three and a half times as likely. What the research tells us is it's not quite that strong, but those teams are still twice as likely to be highly productive. So still a very significant figure. And now I get the genuine pleasure of introducing to you Kim Daji. And Kim is the HR Director, as I mentioned, for William Buck Christmas Gowland. And our thinking here is that you've got the next day and a half to concentrate on technical skills. We've just given you the research that shows how important soft skills are, so we want to tell you a bit of a story around that. Kim Daji is, has a, a broad background. She's worked with organisations as broad as Goodman Fielder, Fletcher Challenge Forests, GlaxoSmithKline in the world of pharmaceuticals, and that's before moving into professional services. And I'm very confident in saying that Kim is equally expert in and passionate about this topic of how to get the most profit through people. So please welcome Kim Daji. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited and certainly feel extremely privileged to be here today speaking to you um, about a topic that is definitely very near and dear to my heart. Oh, and I'm going the wrong way already. There we go. So for the last uh, influential in terms of the teams that you lead and your roles within your organisations. For the last seven years, I've been working for William Buck Christmas Gowland, and it has been my privilege uh, to work with that chartered accounting firm. We face and know the same challenges that you do because they're that, they are exactly the same. They are exciting, but important challenges to overcome. My goal today is to be compelling, to share a possibility that is available to each and every one of you and your teams and potentially your organisations but to be very practical as well. So there are some fatty takeaways, potentially, for you to consider and use moving forward. Sorry. Right. And here is what is available to you. There is a group of employees in your teams and in your organisation that are 50, up to 50% more productive than others up to 30% better performers and significantly more likely to stay in our organisations. The success stories that Karen shared with you up front, this group is one of the key reasons why they are so successful. And I want you to imagine for a moment what it would be like for you, your team and your organisation if your team members could be doing more of this, more productive, better performing than what they currently are. Let's hope I've got it going the right way this time. Yay! <laughs> Dollars. There are, if we have more of this group in our organisations and our teams, there is an opportunity for cost savings. And what would you do with that money? There is also more income to be generated because they do more for our organisations and for our teams. So take a moment again to imagine, what would you do? This is local research done by IBM Conexa in 2012, and they correlate more of these employees, create cost savings and more income. My chance to use that fabulous technology that you've had so much fun with, and there is a bad joke as well to share, Karen shared with me. Right now, at this very point in time, who do you think this group of his employees is? I'll give you 30 seconds to again decide one through five. Who is this group? Who do you think this group is that I'm speaking about? Oh, you're too smart. <laughs> okay. All right. So it sounds like you've all got that. And here is the bad joke. This is my favorite. <laughs> Do we know who they were? I think I heard a lot of people mentioning it. 
Ah, there we go. Now, I was anticipating I'd be speaking to a very intelligent group of people, obviously, and you are absolutely right. It is our engaged employees, that group of engaged employees, the topic's been around for a very, very long time, who do more. They produce more, they perform better, and they are significantly more likely to stay in our organisations. Now, in a business context, engagement and engaged teams is very clinical. So one of the definitions is, let's see how clinical it gets, the extent to which someone is motivated to contribute to organisational success and how much extra discretionary effort they will put in. That's what our engaged employees are being measured against. It also places, the research and the science places employees into three categories. Disengaged, ambivalent and engaged. Very clinical, very sterile. Now I'm going to speak to you about a subject you never thought you would hear at a CFO symposium. I've got a couple of them actually, but this is my first one. Because if you strip it right back to the essence of engagement, you will see exactly why engaged employees do more for us. That is because... Oh, wrong way. They love what they do, and that is the essence of engagement. Purely love. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about this and illustrate it by talking about three couples. You have your madly in love couple, the couple that just cannot get enough of each other. They will do whatever is required to help the other person succeed in their dreams and their ambitions. The madly in love couple. Now consider these to be your engaged employees. They love what they do, who they do it for, and who they do it with. I don't get any giggles there. <laughs> but that is why they do so much more for us, because they really enjoy and love what they do. I want you now to consider a couple who is almost wanting separation. They may have even been filing for divorce. They have fallen out of love. Once there was love, but now there is no longer. And the sad reality is that is what it feels like for our disengaged employees. For them, when they come to work, it is a, dis, uh, a, a frustrating and challenging place to come. It is not a happy place, and it actually uh, is very negative for them to be there. So that's the, the couple that is out of love. Then you have your happily married couple. Your couple who have been in a relationship for a long time. They enjoy each other, it's safe, it's secure, and they will do what they need to do to help the other person be successful. These are our ambivalent employees, a word that I really dislike because it doesn't do this group justice. That group, the ambivalent employees, make up often the largest portion of our teams. And they are great people to have in our organisations. They enjoy what they do, they will try their best, they are talented and they have lots of potential. But with this group, depending on who we surround them by, they will end up on a particular end of the continuum. So if we surround them by those employees that are disengaged, speaking negatively about our organisations, our teams and what is going on, then that ambivalent group will head towards that end of the scale, the disengaged end. If we surround them, however, by people that are enjoying what they do, finding uh, problems and overcoming them, are action oriented and energetic, then they will head down towards that end of the scale, the engaged end of the scale, and that's where we want them. So I searched for compelling case studies that would be relevant, useful, and uh, you know, important to you in my preparation for this opportunity. I found a couple, but none were more compelling than the one that I'm going to share with a lot of pride with you today. And it's the story of how far William Buck Christmas Gowland have come in the last three years. Because in 2013, when we undertook our first survey to look at engagement and what we needed to change and do to remain successful in the future, we had 21% of our team 
disengaged from the organisation. They were filing for divorce and wanting separation. We were not a great place to be. Two and a half years later, we are now sitting at almost 40% of the team, 38% of the team, feeling madly in love with what they do, who they do it for, and our clients and the team. That is a significantly different organisation. So the promise of engagement was more productivity, better performance, and higher retention. And we have all of those, definitely. It's m so much more than that, though. It is a group of people who enjoy what they're doing, are problem solving, creating action, having huge amounts of energy, and nothing is a problem that cannot be overcome. And that is a significantly different organisation than we had two and a half years ago. And so again, we would like to share this story because it is a possibility for each and every one of you to have more of this in your team. And just again, imagine what you could do if that was the case. So now I want to start to share some of those practical takeaways that you might think by sharing with you our story. And our story starts in 2013 at a strategic planning day. So six directors headed off for lots of lively conversation and debate. Very different people, personalities, priorities and strengths. I'm sure that's a very familiar concept, a strategic planning day like that. But when they came back, they shared an aspiration with myself and the senior team, and we realised that that was no ordinary strategic planning day at all. And what they shared was an aspiration to create an exceptional place to work, a place where talented people would love to come to do their best for, their, for our clients, for themselves and for our team. And then they said, wait, there's more. Something that every HR director would love to hear. We've got values that we want everybody's actions to be judged by. And our values moving forward will be care, cooperate and celebrate. We will be judged by those as directors and we want our team to judge themselves against those as well. Now I have helped craft many motivational words from very well intentioned leaders across my time in HR. This felt very, very different to me and the reason it felt different was because that aspiration meant something very personal for each and every one of them. And over the course of the next weeks and months, as I spoke to them and we formulated action plans, it was very clear, it was meaningful, it was a legacy, it was a successful business, it was something that was very personally aligned with their values. It was a contribution to others, and there was more than a little competition absolutely in there. We then told the team, they shared it with the team, we want to create an exceptional place to work where you will love to come and do your very, very best. And then it was out there. We wanted to find out exactly where we were versus exceptional. So if we wanted to be exceptional, where did we currently sit? Where was our line in the stand? Where was our starting point? And we looked at a number of different tools to actually assist us with that. There is a lot of science and research that lies behind engagement and you will love it because my chartered accountants did for sure. There's lots of numbers and science. You don't have to guess. We then undertook our first survey in 2013. We've done it three times since then. It is nerve-wracking every single time you wait for those survey results. That first time, going through our mind was, do they love us? Are we exceptional? I'm pretty sure we're not exceptional. How far away are we? Are we good or are we bad? And then the results came in. And that was a very humbling experience that first time. We had a few strengths and we grasped those and we said, oh my gosh, we've got some, let's, ta let's make sure we celebrate those. More so, we had many, many areas that we were told that we needed to improve if we wanted to reach that aspiration of being an exceptional place to work. Really concerningly, most concerningly, was the 21% of the team that felt we were not a great place to be. That is not exceptional, and that wasn't acceptable to us at all. But we had our line in the sand. Research, the team and science all telling us very clearly about where our shortcomings were. So many leverage points. 
common purpose, communication and cooperation, well-being, reward and recognition, learning and development, the list went on around where we needed to focus. And exceptional was a huge way off in the distance, a very long way off into the distance. And we had that 21% of the team, probably even more, waiting very cynically to see, will they falter? Are they really going to deliver on this? Are they going to get too busy and have other priorities that get in the way? This is a critical point in our story, however. We knew we needed to be different and to do things differently in order to create something different. So how's this for different? Another word, very shortly, that you never anticipated you'd hear at the CFO Symposium. The senior team, that's 14 people, the senior leaders, including the six directors, undertook a 14-week program called the Jolt Challenge. Now, Jolt Challenge, the creators of Jolt say that it is a holistic, self-intelligent system that equips individuals, teams and organisations to thrive. Self-intelligence. Very different. It was certainly different than anything we'd ever done before. But we needed to lead the team differently. And we came up with the concept of the me that was required. We needed to lead differently, and it was not about anybody else in that organisation, it was about me personally. What do I need to do? Who do I need to be? Think, act, behave and believe in order to create that exceptional place that we so wanted to do. That 11-week program around self-intelligence, how we could manage ourselves better by understanding ourselves better, gave us many things to think about, huge insights into why we chose to do certain things, why we held certain beliefs, why we behaved in certain ways, particularly under stress, and it gave us a whole lot of tools that we could use individually to help be the me that was required. Tools that we could use to change things if we needed to. I think really importantly for that senior team, we, ha we were very clear that we could change. That experience showed us that we could change and that we had the immense capability to do so if we chose to. The first changes were very small, usually to do with our personal health, maybe our personal relationships, but those changes have become so much more. They've become very bold, very evident, and we hold each other accountable as well. But accountable in a way that people who know us really well, including ourselves, and who want us to succeed and who respect us do. And those changes are very evident to the team and they help us move forward. Those me's that are required are more consistent, more humane and more accountable. And we're on a journey, and that's what we refer to it as. We're on a journey, it's invitation only, it's very, very elite. Would you like to join us is the question we ask every person that we recruit into the team. So we're on a way to an exceptional place to work. We've started at OK, we've gotten to much better, well above average in fact, and we're off to exceptional. But we are going somewhere no other accounting firm has ever gone before. And this concept of journey gives us an exciting destination to head towards. It gets something out there that's meaningful and challenging and we know it's not about the here and the now, it's something out there in the future and it keeps us moving forward. That concept of journey also relieves the pressure of being perfect here and now. And when we relieve that pressure of being absolutely perfect here and now, we try things. We try and we fail. We try and most of the time we are successful in some way. We grow, we learn, we improve and we change and that is really, really important. The other thing about a journey is that it allows you to look for markers and signals to say that you are on the right track or have you slightly deviated. We're very, very vigilant for signs that show we're off, the, off track and we will make changes if we need to very, very quickly. More importantly, we are looking for signs to say that we are on the right track each and every day. The, the surveys that we've done three times give us formal lines in the sand, but it's those conversations around the organisation that check in. Things like, was that care? I don't think so. I'll need to try something else. 
That was exceptional client service and we're going to celebrate that. Let's share that with other people. That was an exceptional client service and I need to remedy that. What do I do? Care, cooperate, celebrate, being talked about all the time and exceptional being a, a very common conversation. So we seek out signals to say we're on the right track and we will make changes when we need to, but we are heading on the right track and so we're going to stay the course. Now I'd like to introduce you to some of our gorgeous team and these are actually some of our gorgeous team members. In a moment you're going to have the opportunity to meet with a couple of them including one of these people. So they come to work at a place that they love to come to do their very best, enjoy the clients that they work with and the people that they work with and they will go above and beyond for us. But our love is mutual and that's really important. Only true love, only mutual love is true love. And so this shows through in our actions. And an example of this recently was last year, we changed our typical mid-year review process and we created something called a personal agenda. Now a personal agenda is an opportunity for every one of our team to think about what life they want to lead, what they want to achieve, what they want to do. And it is so much broader than a career goal with us, or even five, ten years out, and it goes so much further than their time with William Buck Christmas Gowland. But we ask each and every t person to do that. We suggest they consider the big three, health, wealth and relationships in that personal agenda, but we prescribe absolutely nothing. Their life, their achievements and it's their responsibility. What we would like to do is to help in any way possible. And so when they've formulated that personal agenda, they have the opportunity to come and meet with a couple of the senior team. And this, their job is to listen to the personal agenda, to help people with suggestions, and also to see how we can help them with that agenda. Really important, how can we help? So we aspire to be an important part of every single team member's journey through life for the time that they're with William Buck Christmas Gowland. That time might be short, it might be long, but you will leave better off for having been part of the William Buck team. We hope us when they need to as our greatest fans and our biggest ambassadors. Because true love is mutual and we choose to love the ones we're with. So there it is a case study, a story, a very short story of a group of chartered accountants making engagement happen and reaping the benefits. And the takeaways are very, very simple. The essence of engagement, which usually feels so clinical, is simply love. If you want to choose to do something different, make sure the aspiration is meaningful to you. Measure. There's a huge amount of science behind this concept. Figure out where your levers are and make them happen. Who is the me that's required to do what you want to do? What do you need to change? Who do you need to be? What do you need to believe? A journey. Make it a fun one. Enjoy the journey along the way, but make sure that you're continually staying the course and moving forward. And love your teams. True love is mutual love, and you will reap the benefits from that. So what we'd like to do now is actually to invite another two of our team members, Lester Gowland and Asish Chand. And I'm going to pose them a couple of questions so that you can actually hear from their perspectives what it has been like to be part of this journey and the changes in our organisation. So I'd like to wel welcome Asish and Lester. <laughs> Now, I'm not quite as tall as Bernard, so I hope you know, you'll, you'll forgive me. <laughs> My first question's for you, Lester. So the promise of engagement is better performance, productivity, and better retention. What do you think? It's absolutely true, Kim. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's been astounding, the changes that we've seen you know, in our firm in such a short period of time. The atmosphere has changed significantly, and you can just feel it when you walk around the office now. From two years ago, you know, it was quiet. Now we get things like laughter. You know, people really enjoy being in the office and being together. So it's just been fantastic. 
uh, the way the atmosphere has changed. And other people have told us that as well. People will come into our office and they'll hear laughter and those sorts of things and they'll comment on that to me. And, you know, from my point of view, that, that's very, very satisfying. Our staff turnover has changed uh, significantly. Uh, Kim, as you'll know, we've gone from something like 25% uh, turnover to 7%. So that's a quarter of what it used to be. And you'll all know how much it costs to hire people. So that's a significant cost saving for us. Another great feature is the co cooperation we now have between our teams. We work in uh, six teams. It has to work that way for efficiency, but we also need to cooperate, and that's really changed as well over the last little while. And our communication has also changed significantly, and that's come from the top down. We've recognised that we've had to change as well. And now we're in the great situation of people now asking if they can come and work for us. So to me, that's the ultimate success you know, measure. So it's, it's been a huge change. All right, Asish. Hmm? My story sounds like it's been all rosy, which it definitely hasn't been. There's been more than a little bit of drama along the way. So what has been uh, one of the most challenging parts of the journey so far for you personally? Um, so the most challenging part for me personally has been from the, basically the start <coughs> of this journey, uh, whether or not I'm believing that firstly there was going to be some changes made as a result of the surveys. And secondly, that the, that the changes will be very positive for all of us. And the reason why I was so skeptical at the start is because one of the key things that was highlighted in the survey, the first survey, was that we had a major lack of communication. But one thing surprised me right after the survey results came out is that the directors started sending out emails letting us know what was going on in the organisation and what was going to be coming up in, soon in the future. Um, also, a notice board was put up in the kitchen, which was actually constantly updated, and Kim does it pretty much every day still. And a suggestion box was placed in the kitchen as well. And the way we tested the suggestion box out is that we got a group of people together, and we suggested that we have casual Fridays, and it worked. <laughs> so <laughs> now we have casual Fridays, just you know, as an easy one. So what appeared to be, for me, a challenge and start has actually come about with a raft of great positive changes for all of us. So Lester, outside the business benefits, from a personal perspective, what have been some of the highlights for you? Personally, I think the way that people have accepted the change, it, it's always a bit dangerous when you want to, to change an organisation's culture and you know, the, the things that we wanted to do as directors, I suppose, around the firm. So we were a bit scared on how people may react, as Asish mentioned, you know, they're a bit sceptical. So that was really, really pleasing, the positive attitude that came through. Like I said, the atmosphere has changed so much. So they're very accepting of that. And as directors, we were really, really conscious that we were dealing with people and people who may have been with us for a, for a while. So we had to be, I think, aware of the humanity of what we were doing. But I think the greatest thing from my point of view has been our team challenge that we had last year. It was a wellness challenge. It's all part of making the team a better team. And we had our project which was called Walking to Malawi. And uh, most of you will know that there's actually some water in between uh, us and Malawi, so it was actually a virtual challenge. But what we were doing is we were going into teams of six, and or six teams I should say, and we tried to work together to make sure as a team and as a firm we were, walked as many steps as it took to get us to Malawi. And what were we trying to do? We were trying to get the, the teamwork within the, the, uh, our people and make them really feel better and do things with them and their families. And it was a fantastic success. And the, the goal at the end was to make sure we provided water and land management skills to the people of Malawi who really needed them. So we had a real challenge behind the work that we were doing. And we not only got to Malawi, we actually got way further. We actually got to Egypt. So, uh, from my point of view, Kim, uh, it's just the absolute highlight of my career, uh, the way everything worked out. So, that definitely is the highlight. And Asish, what about from your perspective? What has been the highlight for you personally? Uh, 
personally. Um, I think just generally the change in the environment has been really good from a negative environment that we had initially to a very positive and I would like to think that it's a really a driven one as well. Um, for me personally has been the change in our review process from a mid-year review to a personal agenda. A uh, review for me is how you fit into the firm, whereas a personal agenda is how your goals can be aligned with the firm's goals. So when I was a senior accountant, uh, we had reviews, and when I went back and had a look at my review notes, all I had on there was how do I become a manager, how am I performing at work, and that's it. Whereas a personal agenda, now I can sit down with the directors and openly discuss about my family, about my well-being, about my health, and also the goals at work and how they can all be a aligned and actually work together on all of them. So it actually be really interesting to see that. Mm. Okay. So thank you very much for that. Now we are obviously very proud of the journey that we've, we've been on in the last two and a half years. The reason why we share this with you is because we think it is very much a possibility for each and every one of you. The promise is more productivity, more performance, better retention, but so much more. A team that can help you face the challenges which you will need to face in the coming years. So the research and the story is compelling. And we would like to leave it there and offer you the opportunity to join us if you would like to at our booth later on to talk more about our story and also hopefully to share your story with us as well so that we can glean some um, outcomes from that too. I'm gonna to pass back to Kieran. Thanks very much indeed, Kim. And in closing, I'd just like to say two things, which are neither of those. This one, care to join us. Firstly, our booth is just outside the door to the right. If you'd like to ask Kim about any of that research, please do. But also, we are launching a website at the end of this year aimed at CFOs in New Zealand and Australia. It's going to include various solutions, advice, value and opinions. And opinions particularly is what we're looking for. If you would like to influence the debate and influence the world that CFOs live in in New Zealand, we are putting together an editorial advisory panel. Very grateful to those who've joined. We're looking for a couple more minds and love to speak to you. All that remains to say is we are William Buck, Christmas Gowland, and we thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. Thank you.